So good evening, everybody. We're meeting with John Fraser, who is a Chicago-based artist that I've known somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, 26 years or so. And John, um, I'm curious, you know, you went to high school in the Midwest. Where did you go to high school, and how did you get from there to here, briefly? I went, you're breaking up, Paul, but I went to New Trier High School in Winnetka. Okay, proceed. And um, we had eight people teaching art within that school. That's a lot. Well, it was interesting at the time, you're talking late 60s, early 70s, and half of them had MFAs. So New Trier has an, a reputation for being very involved in theater, music, and the arts, visual and otherwise. And at the time, I didn't know how lucky I was. So when I went off to undergraduate school, I went to the school in Iowa that had a student body of 1,000, as opposed to my high school student body of 100. And my class, my graduating class had 800. And um, I came back to Chicago in 1973. Are we still hearing each other? Yeah, but you've broken up periodically, but I'm, let's just keep going. Okay, that's fine. Um, you're breaking up, too, on this end. Anyway, uh, so I went off to a little school in Iowa called Simpson College, and I was one of four art majors on campus. Did you know when you were in high school that you wanted to... Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I did. We are breaking up. But, um, yes, I, I wanted to be an artist since I was a young boy. I was one of those rare children that had both parents fully supportive of my talent. They never questioned what I wanted to do. They did instill the, the impetus in me to have a job, to make a living, to support those needs. Uh, so, um, you know, I had a, a number of teachers, high school and college, that said it's a lot easier to be an artist when you're not starving. So the starving artist issue doesn't apply. So I was always able to make a living, whether I was bartending or waiting table or working in a warehouse, which I did up until 1983. Um, to support my domestic needs, and I never felt that I had to subjugate my my uh, artwork to those kind of requirements. So I was very lucky with some teachers and having two parents that supported me completely. So when I came back to Chicago, I enrolled in Roosevelt University as a conscience subjector because I was about to be drafted to go to Vietnam. Uh, I had a draft number of 23. Mine was three. <laughs> And, you know, I didn't have the wherewithal to go anywhere. I, I thought I'd just enlist. I, I didn't know where I'd go. Probably Coast Guard because my family were maybe in Coast Guard people. And um, my draft board in Glenview got burned down, so it never, ever happened. And uh, war came to an end. I was in between undergraduate and graduate school, and I felt that I just needed to go get a job, which is what I did. And so I went to work in a warehouse for a Chicago-based clothing company and did my work whenever I could. And ultimately, I became uh, an officer of the company and traveled coast to coast working with factories and in uh, different parts of the globe. And while I was doing that, and while I was in the hotel rooms, I was making my work, collecting material, taking pictures. And um, there was never any pressure to make a living with my art at that time. And so I think I was very fortunate that um, I never had to adjust my personal needs or, or take the art in a direction that might be considered more fashionable in order to sell. Um, I was working in the fashion business, so I was already totally opposed to the issue of the temporary. So I was trying to focus on uh, timeless issues and things that would sustain my interest. And And you just froze again. This is annoying to me. We're going to get it. It'll come back, but it's, this is frustrating. We're going to sit this one out, you guys. This is annoying. Thank you for your patience, people.
I can see the rest of you guys moving, but John, I don't see at all. This is an unusual situation. Could you just continue over the telephone? You know, that's not a bad idea, because he was on the phone earlier, Jerry. Um, when he comes back, maybe I'll suggest that. Paul, are you there? Yeah, but you were gone for a long time. You know what I think might be a good idea, John, is if I you stop using. Audio. Yeah, but maybe you should maybe you should phone in, and maybe that way we won't be reliant on the internet. And even if we lose your photo period, image periodically, we'll be able to continue the discussion. I went and got the phone. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna Do access that. So I'm going to access so I can get all those numbers that I need. Unless okay. I'm gonna... All right. Fine. I'll but. Uh, um, yeah, we are now recording. Um, so yeah, John, go ahead. You were talking about how you were doing art in the hotel rooms and that you weren't financially pressured to make your art and your art had a certain freedom because of that. Um, that is true. Um, you tell me if I'm not being heard. Right. Well, yes. So um, as I traveled, I was able to collect material, and at the time, there weren't computers uh, in the business I was in, and we were using uh, telexes and phone communications, et cetera, very, very low budget, very uh, analog, and I was able to collect, you know, it's eight years' worth of raw material, postage stamps, envelopes, things that were very uh, exotic based on their locale and their origin, and I just started collecting this, this massive material. Now, remember, my undergraduate studies were in painting and drawing. And at the time that I'm talking about, which is the, the mid-70s, I was using my camera to collect data and also to exercise my creative abilities. Uh, the job was so demanding, I was working 75 to 80 hours a week, but it was all also a gas. And my mortality wasn't in question at the time. I just kept on working. Uh, it got to the point where the photographic work became too financially restrictive and costly. And I started to get back into working with mixed media and collage and work on paper. You just froze again, John. Do you see the phone number there that Sarah posted? I'm going to pause this again. That seems wise. So at least when we listen to the recording, it won't be so embarrassing. We're recording, John, now, um, again. And it wouldn't surprise me if we have a problem again, but keep talking. Go ahead. I don't remember exactly where we were. Maybe you do. Uh, I was saying that uh, somewhere in the, I'll say the late 70s, early 80s, I was um, working a job as a clothing designer, a apparel designer for a company based out of Chicago, working with factories in four different countries. I never mentioned the countries, but that doesn't matter. And I was traveling coast to coast to uh, meet with the people that I was in charge of uh, with my design, since I was the in-house designer and an officer. And while I was doing that, I was doing my personal work. And the personal work never had to be dependent upon uh, sales or representation. I produced the work. I showed it when I could many times on the street. And... Um, all of which in pursuit of gallery representation, which took a while to happen. But meanwhile, while that happened, I was getting immediate response from people that seemed to understand what I was trying to communicate, and I was able to support myself and segue from being a, an employee of an international company to being self-employed and pursue my work. And that led to me being invited back to graduate school and to teach and then pursue whatever happened afterwards. Which that's not know. how I remember the story. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. That's not how I remember the story. Um, well, so, illuminating. Yeah, one of us has got to illuminate, illuminate the other, and I suspect it's going to be you, me. But all right, so describe the art that you were making before you went to graduate school. It was um, fairly, fairly precious. I'll use the word precious. Uh, some people referred to it as being nostalgic uh, only because of I, the fact, I believe, that I was using found material that had 
uh, a connection to the past. So whether it was um, antique botanical engravings or um, things that might be considered fetishistic, but I was working with sort of the influence of a number of artists that worked in collage, Kurt Schwitters, Joseph Cornell, many other influences like that, Hannah-Laura Barron, so that there was a point where my work was hopefully connecting to an historical past within that medium, which I still work in collage primarily. Um, and I felt that as I traveled and as I showed the work, uh, the scale of the materials that I was working with dictated sort of an intimacy that meant the scale of the actual works were small. I usually presented the work in the shadow boxes, which were stepped le levels of various board that had carefully mounted papers that would allow these little objects to be countersunk and be uh, maybe behind glass, maybe not, but that being behind glass has sort of heightened uh, an issue of preciousness. It almost set them up as being artifacts of a perhaps a different time. I also remember there were freestanding pieces, weren't there? There were some freestanding objects that had um, that might have a reference to uh, ancient cultures and their habitats that had stilt houses and things that might be considered connected to models of a previous time. And they were also equally as obsessed in their making. There were um, every kind of combination of materials, natural and, and man-made, were used in these objects, these assemblage. And that drove me to um, to the point where I had to start reducing things. Um, you know, the point. Time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. But before we get there, did you have a gallery at that time? I was showing at this very moment that we're talking about. I was showing with a gallery in Denver by the name of Roby Slayback. I don't. Rem I think it was Barbara Slayback, but Joan Roby ended up taking the gallery over, and they were based in Denver. I was working with a gallery in Miami by the name of Harriet Netsky, which had a fairly powerful past. She also ended up going out of business. I was also handled by a gallery in D.C. called um, Art South. And at that point, um, I'd say within the next two years, I joined Mongerson Wonderlick in Chicago, which was my first formal gallery in Chicago. And, and this was before you went to graduate school? Before I went to graduate school. Now, my recollection was is that you were showing in a fair number of street fairs and, you know, art fairs, like, you know, those kinds of things. Not, you know, not fine art fairs, but street art fairs. Is that so? That is very, that is very correct. But um, I did two different kinds of fairs when I was out there, and we're talking about the 70s to 1984. I was showing, uh, the only show in Chicago of consequence was the Old Town Art Fair, which very hard to get into. Somebody would have to leave that fair before you would be invited in. Uh, the Milwaukee Lakefront Festival was a very high-quality event. I did a few fairs that did some charitable work that I believed in, so I would I would also be part of those events because I believed in what their cause was. Uh, the best shows I ever did when I was on the street were the ones in Florida, and they were the Coconut Grove Art Festival and Las Olas and the Winter Park Art Festival. And, and my sense is that you made you you made you had higher income from the fairs than you did from working with galleries. Well, at the time, uh, I would say it was pretty equal. What was interesting okay. for me, though, is that uh, I was able to meet people. Like, for instance, just to give you an example, at the time, the Coconut Grove Art Festival was a four-day event. It started on Thursday, went Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and it closed at about 6 o'clock on Sunday. Um, anywhere from 800,000 to a million people came through that event in those four days. Wow. Uh, I, I raised... Um, the needed funds to buy my house or to put the down payment out of my house in one day in that event. And you're talking about jurors that would come down from the galleries in New York to get out of the cold and they would be the contracted jurors for that event. And at the time, Miami and Fort Lauderdale did not have an active gallery scene. There were a couple serious galleries. Barbara Gilman was one of the good ones. Harriet Nesky, who represented me, I think was a pretty strong gallery. But at the time, most of the shows in Florida where the money was, the award money was, uh, I really felt that there were a good 10 to 15 percent of the artists involved all had master's degrees, which I did not have at the time. My thought was is that at that time you decided to shift direction and gears and that you, were, you didn't particularly consider yourself, your emphasis, a fine artist, but more, I don't know, a craft or something less fine. 
Is that so, or you don't? Or is my recollection fuzzy? Well, it isn't fuzzy. Uh, I think we just need to clarify a couple things. I was doing these little precious collage constructions, and they were they were naive. There's no question they were naive. And I think that um, what happened was in the process of just natural evolution, I think these things became more and more reduced, and I became more and more aware of the fact that I couldn't do both. I couldn't be totally self-contained and self-evolved without having representation. To have representation, you have to give up your previous life. You can't be on the street selling independently and also have a gallery, as, as Catherine said earlier. So I think that you're not going to ever secure representation by doing anything independent. And I think that um, you can pursue a career and do it in a way that uh, really indicates your talent, but I do think sooner or later you've got to commit to a partnership because you you really cannot get the kind of exposure alone without having a gallery to really kind of legitimize what you're doing. Yeah. It's very important. So what happened to me is I had to make a decision, and I can't I can't emphasize this more than what I'm going to, uh, or I can't emphasize it less. My wife, who who has always supported my activity, and I decided that if I had stayed with the clothing company. It probably would have killed me. I, um, the, the hours were incredible. The stress was incredible. And if I had stayed with it for the sake of my income, I would never have pursued my work. So the security of the future meant that I had to leave that, that financial security to pursue my work full time. So I, I did the street for another three years. And ultimately, while I was doing the street, by the way, I was also entering shows all over the country. I was in juried events. I had some small galleries that would include me in group shows. I was being juried into things. And because of the award money from the major street events, which some of them still exist, as well as um, just being able to sort of refocus my, my, my thoughts, uh, somewhere in the mix, I was invited by, a, by David Bauer, who was teaching at uh, NIU at the time. He asked me if I would consider coming back to graduate school. And that was the first time in eight years that I had thought about whether or not I should continue my studies. I had representation. I was showing my work. Uh, everything was going fine. But obviously, I still had some questions that need to be answered. And um, without getting into graduate school too much, I will tell you that I had many questions answered by going back to school. It was two years and two summers. I'm not so sure I could honestly say that the questions that I thought I would have were the ones that really got answered. But regardless, um, for me, it was an important moment. Uh, as soon as I got to the point where I was about to exit graduate school, I had secured representation with Susan Cummins. Uh, Paul, as you know, I had um, been talking with Roy Boyd, who looked at me more seriously once I decided to commit to grad school. And things have sort of just opened up from that point. And the work has evolved, obviously, as a result of those things. And I guess I would say the work that I'm doing now is still evolving from the work that came prior to that moment. So it's just this ongoing evolution and the ongoing hope that uh, I remain interested. Um, were you making more money before or after graduate school? Well, when I left my job, I was making over 50 a year. Just no, not your job. job. I mean, I just, let's just do oh, the art. But, song. but okay. can, you imagine, can you imagine not having the pressure to make a living and just make your work? It's, oh, totally. Uh, I can imagine. It's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> liberating. Um, as we have talked before, um, I did fairly well out there, but it, it was really the award money that allowed me to continue it, and it was the award money that financed my exit. And um, it got to the point where there was a definite parabola where – I reached um, a place where it was it was not even successful to be out there anymore. Whether my, my, my work did not go up in price significantly, it's just that I think I overstayed my welcome. I think as the work became more and more serious and the work became more and more reduced, um, what I knew and what I was learning became more and more alien to that culture. Um, it was time to exit. And it took me um, a little while to get acclimated to a different climate. Um, and But, yes, the, the money issue, I would tell you, it took me about a couple of years to adjust from the income I made from the street to the gallery world. 
when you move into the gallery world, price, the price structure changes drastically. And um, I will tell you that the audience created by being with a gallery quadrupled, and the prices were moving up in relation to that. And what in a very short period of time, I did not feel the feel the loss. So let me let me make a couple statements here and ask you to comment, okay? Sure. And one of the things I say in these courses is that. There's lots of different art villages, and that artists need to find where they want to be and which art village they fit. And that, all right, that's one statement, okay? I want to go on. Another one is that having a gallery is an option, and it is not something that all artists must do. It's something that they have to, you know, it's like getting married, perhaps. They have to make a decision if that's something that's for them or not. So, can you address both those statements? Uh, equal uh, very very easily, and I would say that uh, they're not necessarily equal in my, my way of thinking. Um, what's interesting about being an artist, you know, you think that it's one of uh, one of a solitary pursuit, and it really isn't. Um, we are part of a very vast culture. You know, I think that one of the things that attracted to me to being an artist was the fact that I really felt it was a a pursuit and an activity and a life's work that had a great deal of uh, honor to it. That may not be the right word, but uh, it was a life that I thought that I could respect, and that's what I was pursuing. I also felt that I had something, uh, whether it was a gift uh, that I received or some kind of motivation to continue doing it, and I really felt that it was my way I was married to somebody that believed in what I was doing. That also helped. And it, I was always very much totally confident that I was doing the right thing when I was doing what I was doing. Now, granted, I think growth is, is built in. I think evolution is built in. I think the work will evolve if you allow it to evolve. You know, it's all, it's all suspect to awareness, of course, and time and conditions. But I really think that I was very lucky that those things did come about in, in a unique way relevant to my own individual pursuit. Now, in terms of this village issue, I think that art, you know, you think about these people that are considered artists. We, we are all, there's so many people that are considered artists. I mean, everything that this, exists on this planet right now, whether it's the car you drive, the house you live in, uh, the landscape that you've tendered, uh, any kind of activity you can imagine, it's all governed by a creative pursuit. So I, I, me being an artist, I, I'm just really a maker of things, and I've found a way to survive making things. And I have an audience that goes about collecting work. And, and I, I, the collecting thing is a whole other thing. I, I think it's more about having the need to live with something made by somebody that cares and somebody that works with their hands, and it's something that connects us to uh, the infinite past as well as where we're headed. So I think that people that um, – can make those judgment calls of whether they're ready to, to prepare themselves for a life where, for whether it's good or bad, they're going to keep making things. Uh, they may not all be good, but nevertheless, if you keep on making things and you are in, involved in the critical process of making judgment calls of whether that should be seen or not by the public, that will add to this village concept. But I, I don't think there's any reason to think that the only way to do it is through the galleries. And I don't think there's any way, any reason to think that uh, if you have a need to have something outside of the work process itself, i.e., uh, recognition, fame, wealth, then you are doing the wrong thing. That is, that is really not the motivation for being an artist. Those are byproducts of the process, and nothing more than byproducts. Uh, it's, it's such a long haul before you have any impact, before anyone recognizes what you're doing, before you have any chance of communicating. The only thing to do is focus on the work. It, now, if, and again, I keep on saying, if you remain interested, that should be the goal. And I think everything else comes later or after or as a result of the work process. I've been lucky. I've found my way into a series of relationships. Paul, you've been one of those relationships where over an extended period of time, I've developed friendships, and the friendships are what drive me. So I don't know if I answered that in a way that is understandable, but let's let's go forward. Fair enough. <laughs> um, 
Another thing we discuss in this class is the three criteria for a successful career. And I think number one is relationships. Or, or no, I think number two is relationships. I think number one is being unique or making art that's discernible from other people's art. And, um, and then number three is the quality of the art. So, I mean, I was going to say that I think an awful lot of the decisions that you've made career-wise have been an extension of the art that you've made and your belief in your art and, you know, and other people like liking it and identifying with it. But then you threw me the curveball about, you know, how relationships have guided you. So can you clarify that, or it's a mix? Talk about it. It is a mix. And, Paul, these are these are very important questions. And, you know, when, when you deal with the people that you're dealing with in this whole thing, uh, your past and our very present, um, we deal in a nonverbal activity. And, and, of course, art has its own visual language. So the fact that we have a chance to discuss these things and ask questions in order to perhaps uh, – get a greater understanding of why we do it this and why we bother doing it uh, is very interesting. Well, I would tell you that the relationships um, and the friendships and um, all the people that I haven't met yet that I will meet, they are so important to that connection uh, that I think drives all creative people to do what they do. If, you know, we can't just constantly think about the headlines because we wouldn't. We would, um, we would die. And I think that uh, the point is that we, you know, in terms of uh, technology and its impact on art making, it's here to stay. It's here, and it's it's wonderful, but it doesn't do away with the need to draw in the mud with a stick or to put two pieces of wood together and, and make something. Uh, we do have a primal need to build, and I think that uh, the relationships of one person to another fosters that communication that allows us to evolve and to keep building and making things. Uh, to what extent do those relationships influence the making of your art or the art or what you make or how it looks? Well, I will tell you that um, I would love to give credit to instructors that I've had, but I, I don't think that would be honest. Um, I really think that I've been pretty self-motivated, and while I respect a countless number of people uh, historically uh, in the past and present, I think I would have to be try to um, basically assert the reality that my work is driven by, its, by it, itself. I, I try to produce work that uh, it does have allegiance to many people, which we could talk about at great length. This is not the time, I don't think. But I would tell you that I really try to let the work drive what's coming. But it's also because I, I'm very happy and comfortable knowing that I live in a world where there are artists that I respect and I've studied at, le at length that are out there also independently living, breathing, and making things that make my world easier to live in. Does that make any sense? Sure it does. I, um, I, I, I want to know they're out there. Yeah, and I, I think we want to hear from some of the people in this class that are out there, and I want to open this up to questions. So if you guys have questions, start raising your hands, and we'll get you in a moment. I want to know, John, when did you figure out you were successful? Or are you? Have you? Is that something you concluded long ago, recently what? I think it's... Um, my motivation exists in the work, so I think from that standpoint, I am incredibly successful. I couldn't ask for anything more. In terms of the outside world and its influence on me, um, I try to keep that at, not at a distance, but I don't. I don't give it any too. I don't give it too much credit for my comfort or my or the word success. I've had my more than my share of recognition and more sh more than my share of support, and I have many, many, many collectors that have been so important to my existence, and most of them have become good friends at this point, that I, um, I would say that it's all wrapped up in one big ball, and my responsibility is to keep that ball rolling and keep the, uh, I guess, keep the evolution going, and fortunately, I still have the strength and the interest to um, take some chances. I have dropped anchor. I'm, I am working on some things that um, for the next 10 years will probably touch upon what I've already done in a different way perhaps, but um, I'm, at, I'm at that stage in my career where I, I am really got to, you know, I've got to deal with what I've already started and not try to change. Fair enough. Andy, let's go to you. Go ahead, Andy. Ask the question of John Fraser. 
John. Thanks for these insights. These are these are great. Um, one thing that I was wondering about with the uh, talk about the uh, Masters of Fine Arts. Um, I'm wondering, uh, like, what would be the 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 viewpoint on that now as to whether like uh, uh, up and coming artists would need uh, that or not in order to be successful. Great question, and um, I will tell you honestly. Um, I think the need exists for all of us to maybe consider that. I don't think it's a necessarily a requirement, but I do feel that you might want to insulate yourself from the outside world and thrust yourself into the context of graduate school. And again, choosing the right one and with the right faculty is very important. But uh, once the research is done and you have narrowed your search and made some decisions relative to who you might be working with, and there's no guarantee you would be at that time, um, I, for me, I think I, I have to tell all my students, and by the way, I teach part-time right now because I'm too busy, but I tell my students that they have to consider it because I just think the experience is too valuable. I don't think it's going to give you the secrets to a life in the arts. I don't think it's going to help you necessarily you know, formalize or even stabilize your thoughts on the matter, but I do think you need to consider it. You notice that this is something rather different than what Catherine Edelman had expressed about graduate school. So, Can I continue? You know, I didn't want to yeah, take up too much time with one question, but I, I want to add to this. I don't think it will influence a career the way it used to. I think it's important to remember that in 19, let's say, 60, there was only two or three art schools in the country that offered uh, continuing education in the arts. I, I think this master's degree or the terminal degree of MFA, there might be a, a doctorate in studio arts at one location at this point, and I think that's questionable. I, I think that um, it's still a pretty unique phenomenon. You know, then there was that phase, you know, as the factory of academia required that you know you, you couldn't do anything without it. And as they've changed their course so many times, it's hard to really figure out where you want to fit into that whole equation. I think, um, I don't think it's, you know, you, the fact is you had to do it to get a teaching job. But at this point, there's no teaching jobs. And if there are any teaching jobs, they're given to one-year appointments on a rotating basis, and there's no solidarity to that lifestyle. And I, I guess the teaching experience is valuable too. But I think to go, get, go for a master's degree should be determined by your need to pursue your study, not to get a teaching job. And I think that how much time was there between when you graduated from college and when you got your master's? Thirteen and a half years. You think that's relevant? I mean, you think you need to get out in the world and learn a little bit about what you don't know and what you do know, so that you have a perspective before you go to graduate school? I'll say yes, but that's my perspective. I yeah, think well, it helped. I, don't I mean, I was I was a warehouse manager, a shipping clerk, a vice president of design in, in a corporation, and uh, I came to graduate school with some knowledge that allowed me to choose, pick and choose what I wanted to do within that context. So I, I think it, I think to go right into graduate school, I think might shortchange the experience if you're going to do it. I suspect that's correct. Cool, Andy, uh, are we done? Do you have more to say? Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks a lot. All right, you're muted again. Thank you very much, Andy. And I noticed that um, Monica had a question, and I could use some more questions, folks, after Monica's. Go ahead, Monica. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, I, uh, thank you, John, for coming. And also, uh, I've been looking at your website, and I really enjoyed seeing the very clean work that uh, you showed recently with uh, Roy Boyd. Uh, I'm curious about your gallery in uh, Munich, the Nazi Center. I noticed the last show was four years ago. Do you still have a relationship with her? And also, how did you come about uh, making uh, a connection in Germany? Thank you. I um, very much appreciate, Monica, your, your question. Um, I met uh, Renata Bender a number of years ago at the Chicago Expo. At the time, it was called Art Chicago. And I really um, felt very connected to her, her mission statement and her, the artist that she represented. I've become good friends with her companion, Peter Weber, who's one of her artists. And I presented my work to her, and she had met um, my Chicago dealer, Roy Boyd, and they had somewhat of a, a handling 
or pardon me, a, a relationship handling another number of people. And what happened was um, she approached me and asked um, how I'd feel about showing in Munich. And I approached Roy Boyd, and he allowed me to work with her independently. Sometimes dealers do not want to work with other dealers. Or they, if they do, they want to be somewhat involved in all the details, as you can imagine. Uh, Roy did not need to be involved, and so Renata and I have developed a very strong relationship. I'm still with her. Uh, at this very second, she has my work in a group show of six artists in Austria, uh, which is a really an interesting thing. Um, it's on my website. You'll see it. But basically, it's a private collector and gallery owner that built a white cube on their property to host ex exhibitions. And they bring in curators to curate shows uh, three or four times a year. And what happens is um, they bring the curator in who gets to pick five of the artists, but within the show they have to include one artist from this person's collection. And so I'm in this show right now in Austria that um, that Renata curated. So it's really quite extraordinary that um, she's reaching out. I've been in a couple shows in Austria and throughout Germany in group shows at different um, Kunsthauses, and it's it's really been, uh, I think, a place where my work has been given a great deal of reception. My work is not for everybody, but I think Europe is uh, very much open to what I'm doing. So Renata Bender has been very good for me. I think that's true that Europe would be very responsive to what you're doing. That's cool. Thank you, Monica. I'm very lucky. Thank you, Monica. Um, I saw somebody who, I mean, I see a number of hands up. That's good. But I, I was trying, somebody I think I was going to ask, and their hand went down. Um, who hasn't talked tonight? Greg, you're unmuted. Greg, what's up? Nope, you're not. Now, you, there you go. <laughs> Greg? Hi. Are you frozen now? No, we can answer you. I'm going to wait a minute, Greg. Hold, I'm muting you again. I'm going to come back to you after I talk to, after Homa talks to us. Homa, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Roy. Uh, I just saw your show at the. Um, hi, John. I saw your show at the Roy Boyd Gallery, and it's just beautiful. Thank you. And Mom. I wanted. It, it's just gorgeous. And I wanted to ask you, how did? Uh, can you tell us the story of how Roy Boyd ended up representing you? It's a very interesting story. Um, um, I've, I've had negative response to this this statement, but I will um, try to tell you the truth. My wife and I love art, so before I was represented by anybody, I had started collecting art at a very young age, and um, my wife and I, over a long period of our time, have we built a nice collection. I think it's it's a fairly good collection. We've also donated many pieces to museums uh, since we've started collecting to make room for other things. And in the process of collecting, we, we did meet Roy, and we became friends as collectors. This is prior to grad school. And as time passed, um, and again, I, I'm not limited. I don't feel limited to collecting just out of Chicago. I, I'm one of those people that might be considered offensive because I'm more interested in the, in the artists and their work than the city or the, or the gallery or anything else that governs their work. So I, I study work quite a bit. Um, I'm very much involved in looking at a lot of work all over the globe, and I, and I have to respond to what I feel I need. And when I collect, it, something has to be considered, and that is the collection itself. So my wife and I collect that would fit into what already exists. Anyway, so in the process of collecting, um, I became acquainted with Roy and Anne, and then what happened after that, uh, he started monitoring my progress and came to a number of my openings uh, before I went to grad school. And then once I went to grad school, he became a little more interested in what I was doing. And back when I was doing my abstract photography, which I've taken up again, um, he ended up giving me an award at a show that I was in, along with Don Baum, who I studied with at Roosevelt University. And as a result, w once I got my master's degree, um, he came to my, out, out for my master's show and to a party my wife and I had, uh, for the people that made the effort to come out to St. Charles, where we live. And at that point, he said, what are your plans? And I said, well, I, the work from the show is committed to a gallery in California, Susan Cummins, who I mentioned before. And he said, well, let's when you get back from California, let's talk about what's next. And so I was able to give him a number of pieces right then and there. 
that weren't going to California. And I went out to California for my opening, and I came back, and he had found homes for everything I had given him, and he wanted to talk about a show. So it happened quite quickly after I got my MFA, which was uh, August of 1989. And so it's all kind of moved kind of quickly, and the show that you just saw was my 14th show with him. Wow, that's beautiful. And, and my, Are I you say, at some point it does seem like a blur, but I would also tell you that it's been a long slug also. But um, it's all about the work, as I said, so... But thank you for asking. That's it's a great story. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Let's try Greg again. Homer, thanks. Let me mute you. And Greg, I'm unmuting you, and let's hope for the best. Greg. <laughs> Greg, this isn't working. Tell you what I'd like to do. No, if I'm muting you, Greg, hold on. So, so Greg, do this. Um, I'm not even succeeding in muting you. Greg, type your question in the box below, and I will ask John, okay? Type it in the chat box. And I, yep. Thank you. And I'm going to go to Joyce. Joyce, go ahead. And I was wondering when you exhibit um, in Europe or abroad, um, who pays for the shipping costs, and do you have to get a carne? in order to uh, send work overseas? Great question. Um, most artists, and I, and I hope Paul agrees with me, it is the artist's responsibility to package and ship the work and insure it to get to wherever it's going. It's the return shipment fees that are covered by the gallery. That's part of the 50-50 relationship. The artist is responsible for getting the work to wherever it's going and perhaps to the point where it is framed if it's needed and in preparation for installation. And then when it comes back to the artist, it's, it's the gallery's cost. In terms of the overseas shipments, some of the galleries I work with cover that shipping too. Um, the one in Japan used to cover all, the, all my costs, which was wonderful. And I will tell you that my arrangement with, with Europe, sometimes it is requested. Now, I don't do it always, but because of the duty and the customs issues, Sometimes I undervalue the work to lessen the duty costs, and sometimes you have to roll the dice when you do that. You know that famous story about Robert Ryman and um, his gallery in Germany. I can't think of uh, who it might have been at the time that, uh, for, for the sake of customs, he valued the works as used paper because it was handmade paper that he had painted on. He, they considered it used, so that lowered the duty cost to get it over there, which is uh, just one of those many stories. But the issue is, if you have someone that wants to show your work elsewhere, find a way to make it happen, as long as you trust what's going on and, and as long as you feel this relationship will lead to a good relationship. So this, it's very important to take those things seriously. And, and, yes, it's costly to do all these things. Sooner or later, as your work evolves and it commands a, a larger selling price, the shipping charges, which you'll be deducting the, all along the way, they can be absorbed by your increase in growth and, and success. John, my opinion was that I would pay shipping both ways. Yeah. Um, and I'm not convinced that's the norm, but I think that an artist is really supposed to be making art and that the gallery for their 50% is supposed to be paying shipping both ways, paying for the announcement, paying for a catalog, paying for advertising, and um, maybe that's why I'm not in business. <laughs> well, can I, can I comment on that? Please. I want, I, want every, I want everybody to hear this. Um, I, I think that's, that's really uh, an incredible way to do business, and that's one of the reasons why you've been a bonding agent in the Chicago community for all these years. And we can talk about how many, but that just makes us look older than we are, so I'm not going to get into that. But um, I will tell you that in my experience, um, it's still a 50-50 relationship right now with everybody I'm working with. And what's interesting is uh, the policy I have, which, again, it, you should have the same policy with every person you're working with so that there's no problems in terms of selling price, discount policy, all the things that are relative to developing a long-term relationship with, with a number of dealers that hopefully will communicate to each other and help drive this thing. Uh, so my policy is 50-50. The selling price I try to remain in control of. 
uh, you can always lower or you can always raise your prices. You can never lower them. And the trade in Chicago, as far as I know, and everywhere else gets 20%, whether it's a corporate consultant or um, other arrangements. Uh, private collectors get up to 15, mostly 10, I guess. And I'm willing to split anything up to a 20% discount. But that's it. And usually cool. there was a point in time where photography was covered by the gallery, shipping was covered by the gallery, and then we moved. And I've been through four or five different recessions where galleries had to adjust to accommodate their survival. Certain artists bailed out. Certain artists had legal situations pursue. And some people just said, okay, let's stay in business. Let's keep the gallery going. And we kind of accommodated the change in climate. And so at this point, galleries, I think, from my standpoint, they handle the announcement cards, but the catalogs, no. Uh, shipping, 50-50. So, it, again, it depends. And this all can be worked out with everybody's gallery as they want to work it out. But you can't walk into a situation expecting anything. You work that out, and you develop a relationship. So, John, you've had. I'm, I'm looking at Greg's question, and it's, it's it's a complicated question. But you have relationships with collectors who you've invited out to dinner, and some of those folks must have tried to purchase work directly from you out of the studio and circumvent the gallery. Um, and so, comment about that. What, what's your attitude? How, what's your practice? You never want to. Um, I guess we can be profane. You don't want to shit where you sleep, you know, or any of that stuff. Um, I have remained a, had a strict relationship with my dealers is that I will not subjugate or corrupt the relationship I have with them. The only time I ever sold directly to a person, now I've given work away to collectors that have already owned my work. But, it, but in, terms of, in terms of selling work to a person outside of the gallery context that I'm part of, it has only happened once, and it's to a very important collector that has a lot of my work, and the reason it happened, it was work that came out of a gallery that I was no longer with. It was work that nobody wanted. Came back to the studio. I was in a very vulnerable state at the time, and I asked permission from the person that basically controlled my my situation in the region that we're speaking of. And he said he didn't have a problem with it relative to the context. But that was the only time I've ever violated any kind of gallery arrangement. Have you had more than one gallery in a given city, not you know sequentially? No, and I think that's that's also an important thing to talk about because I mean, you, Paul, you and I worked together, but it was also um, in the in the relation to the fact that it was understood by the other people. You've hosted a lot of artists that have been handled by other galleries, and True. Uh, and it was and it was worked out among you, and that's the way. That's why I don't understand this art world has become a little bit combative for my way of thinking. When we could be working together to form some kind of union. You know, this Chicago is the only city I know that there's warring tribes still. You know, maybe it's because I live here and I don't understand why. When the uncomfortable spaces were here, they spent most of their energies trying to tear down uh, the established galleries or try to get some attention. And I and I never understood why we couldn't all kind of create this environment where, which which is now happening, I think. And Paul, you should be given a lot of credit for this. That it, it doesn't have to be this hostile environment. You know, especially we're connected to the arts. It's you know, when you talk about unco un uncomfortable spaces, for you who don't know, is a, a group of five galleries that identified that were really coarse, and one of them was Tough Gallery. Yeah. You know, and Richard, Richard and I had a really great relationship, and he had a group come from the Tate to visit him, and he said, well, after you've gone here, go over and see Klein. And, you know, those folks wouldn't have come if it hadn't have been for him. You know, you would think that, um, so, you know, I don't know. I don't see the combative thing as much, and I don't know that I want to even talk about it. Um, well, well, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to just throw a net over the whole thing. But there were times where it was tough, and you know, we were we were going through some very difficult economic times in the gallery world, and, uh, and not after, you know, even long after the fire. And I think that there were there was some some negative comments thrown around that didn't need to be thrown around. But I will tell you one thing about those galleries. I think MWMWM was one of those rare spaces. When you think about the people that have come out of that space, you got Arturo Herrera and Michael Hall and Janet Eckelbarger and it just this there was a, an incredible group of people that came out of UIC at that point. You know, I just think that we've had some incredible talent here and we should celebrate them, not this ongoing uh, who's doing better than others and what neighborhoods are better than the others. And there's just too many great places where art can be seen, and you've championed that. 
I also think you have a really nice holistic attitude, you know, and that you have a bring, bring a lot of integrity to what you do. But I, that's, I'm not going to flatter you too much right now. I'm going to move over to Karen and ask Karen to ask her a question. Karen, take it away. Hi, thank you. Um, well, regarding like when you're in school, either undergrad or graduate school, you have this bubble where you you can really grow and explore and focus on your artwork. And you talked about your period of time where you were working. I think you said 60 to 80 hours a week. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Do you feel like your you your creativity was sort of affected? Did you were you less productive in that period of time? And how long did that period last? Great question, and um, thanks for appreciate it, Karen. Um, it's interesting. I, I'd like to look back and be more nostalgic, but um, you know, of course, my memory is that it was just an incredible time. Uh, the 80 hours a week, which, which was the maximum, sometimes it was 50 hours. But um, I will tell you that I had a lot of energy back then. I was younger, of course, like we <laughs> all are, and sleep was not that important. And I probably was testing my mortality whenever I could with whatever I could. And I had a lot of friends that were very involved in music and theater and, and people that I surrounded myself with. And it was a very active time. So, and, you know, I was naive at the time, too. I, I had no doubt that I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to be a full-time artist, and I wanted to commit my life to it. And I knew that I did not want to drive a truck in order to survive. I knew I did not want to wait table forever. I did not want to bartend. So I, I sort of constructed uh, my way out of that situation. And I would tell you it was that, not that, that cliche of it's the journey, not the result, all those things, but I will tell you that the hunger that I had to do both was very important. Uh, I loved the job I had, and my wife was right. If I hadn't left it, I would still be there, and I'd be probably be, my health would have suffered and all these other things. But um, I, I have no questions about that being an important time because I did not have to depend on my art to make a living, and it was it was very important. And you know, once the when the company started folding up because there were some difficult economic times, I had already started those things out in my head and I felt that I was preparing this uh, this way out and I had a way of uh, structuring my life in a different way and perhaps pursue my art in a way that would be considered a career. The word career is an issue that I would like to talk about too because you know, I'm, you know the, the whole career thing I think is corrupted what it means to be an artist. I, I, maybe it's the word, but maybe it's just the semantics of the whole thing. But we can talk about that, Paul. I'll let you direct that. No, go right ahead. Just take roll with it. I, I just think, um, I guess I would say I have a career, but it, it, again, it's one of those things that I referred to previously as a byproduct. Whatever has happened for me is a byproduct of the activity. So I, I'm really not concerned with um, constructing, you know, ahead of time, you can't construct the career. It, it, being an artist, there's no blueprint, there's no pattern of behavior, there's no structure that can allow you um, a way in or a way to build this thing without the work itself. You've got to build the work. And then the work is going to be the result of your values, your personal values, your personal desire, your hunger, your appetite, all these things that um, they create that need to make something. And then that, that, that something that you're making hopefully has some relevance to you know, the current thinking. And hopefully it has some kind, or, or maybe not. Maybe it has a way in, in opposition to what we're thinking. You know, I think that's also important too. What it has to do, and Paul mentioned this earlier, authenticity is crucial. It's the only thing that really governs this whole thing. It's like you know, we don't need any more objects out there. What we need is we need the authentic involvement of the artist, whether they're creating one thing or another, whether it's a great meal, a bottle of wine. Uh, a piece of clothing, a, a work of art, something. But it has to be somewhat connected to everything that came in the past that had authenticity in it. How much how much does saleability come into the equation when you're working on a piece of art? You, you, you walk into the studio or you go into the studio and you have a sense of what has happened before and what did happen to find a home. And you can make a decision to repeat that build upon it, change totally, all those things come into question. But I think some of those things, those, those can be traps. I think you have to sort of um, perhaps step back and, you know, again, this whole thing is governed by how critical an artist is of themselves. You know, you know, you put yourself out there with your work. I mean, that's, that's hard enough. And you, you, know, you subject 
this this thing that was made in secret. You know, you spent all this time creating something with no one else around, and and it's just one of those private excursions into something that you found and it's all about what you found and then you put that out there in the world and hopefully not get lambasted and then you hope to get to the point where that builds upon the next thing and uh you know you know you're in grad school you're in undergraduate school and the teachers talk about this issue of risk and taking chances and you know developing skill that never changes even when you're out of school you've got to constantly take chances you've got to constantly push and then you get to the point where, okay, you've, you've staked out your territory, you've made, a, made your point of what matters to you, you probably have composed an artist statement or another, all of which can be thrown in the garbage pretty quickly um, as your values change, as your life evolves, and as you mature. And you get to the point where you reach uh, a clearing of sorts or level territory, and then you have to actually commit to what you have already started. And you, you know, then there's a point where you, then you really take the risk. You build something that you can't really care what happens. If you have to build it, you have to build it, and then you just kind of wait. And you just kind of, and it might take, you know, this is still a very rare thing for an artist in their lifetime to make a living at it. And the fact that we're communicating almost immediately with what we're doing, that that's also very rare. The point is, if you, you have to really articulate what matters to you in your work. And if you stay interested in doing it, it doesn't matter what happens you will be successful. And I think that's that's what governs my success is that if I if I'm happy happy, I don't like that word. If I'm interested in the work I'm doing and there's something going on that I you know, if I've separated myself from some of that activity to the point where when I see something happen I I'm totally objective or removed and I am surprised. That gives me the indication that I've actually move somewhere else, even if it's not that recognizable to a viewer. I've, ch I've charted a new territory, and then I find a way to the next work. And that's... You, that's you don't feel like... It. What's your thought about a reprise and doing the same work again that you've done before, and or doing work that you've already been satisfied with, or getting into an uncomfortable space and seeking challenges? I think the uncomfortable space is required. But, but I think it's important for everybody to know, mostly the viewer, that an uncomfortable space for them may not be the same thing for the artist. The artist may move into a space that no one sees as being uncomfortable and no one recognizes as being different, but it might be for the artist. But I also think that you, know, you have to allow for the possibility that failure is, is constant. And I think that all you can try to do is, is not fail in making something that's just dead. I, th I think it has to have some kind of life to it, and, and that's where you have to keep your, your sensory apparatus aware of, of when you're not hitting. And again, I think it's, it's a very human quality to have things not be a home run every time. And I think that we, we've all seen all the people that we herald as our champions. They weren't on every single moment. And I think that's okay. And sometimes oh, I totally agree. I'm sorry. I totally I agree. But I also think, Paul, and I know you. I know you agree with this too. Is that it's those um, moments where an artist may or may not be totally on that celebrates their humanity. And 50 years may pass, and all of a sudden that might be a benchmark. And might yeah, and also might generate the most growth. That said, let's go to Mer let's go to Meredith and see what she has to say, Meredith. You've been waiting patiently. Also, Hi. this is what yeah. sec, Meredith. Um, I think we're getting close to a place where we want to think about wrapping up. We've been going a long time tonight. Let's do two or three more questions, and we'll call it a night. Meredith, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thanks, John, for everything you've said. It's very thought-provoking. Um, the things that you were saying about the relationship with the gallery resonated with me um, in two galleries, and... Um, all I want to say about one is that it is not a good relationship. <laughs> uh, that's all I'll say in a in a public forum like this. Um, I recently sold a um, painting uh, via Facebook. I felt no compunction uh, uh, or no necessity to share any of that um, any of that uh, money with uh, either of my galleries. Uh, they didn't do any work. They never even saw the work. 
Um, I I just uh, I just feel that as um, artists struggle to uh, to get their work out there, and the internet becomes more a, a part of it, and it is a very um, personal thing. I do all that work. Uh, that it sort of um, weakens any tie that I might have to a gallery, and I don't feel at all uh, that that's a, a bad thing. If a, if if one of the clients that I've met at one of the receptions that I've attended at the gallery were to come to me on their own and want to buy, then yes, I would uh, share that uh, that commission with uh, with the gallery owner. But here's Here's a work that had nothing to do with that gallery. Can I, in my turn? Yep. I really appreciate your comments, and I am very sensitive and sympathetic to the situation because I've been in this situation many times. I will tell you that um, in your case, I think that perhaps you're not with the people you should be with. Well, if you, if you feel, yeah. again, this is up to you to think about this, but I, I think that. When I've been in a situation where out of whatever need that existed, I had to sell a work and perhaps bypass the system, I've also communicated to the gallery that I had to do so in that particular case. I've never, mm. done, it, I've never done it in a way that was uh, lacking in communication. If, there was, if I had a, a bill to pay or I had a, a dire circumstance that required that I raise some money quickly, I've always communicated to whoever – was in charge of that region where a particular collector might be, and I've asked them their opinion. I said, you know, mm -hmm. times I've even given a, an additional work to a gallery to sell, as long as I could sell another one to make my expenses. But again, I, the, the key I think to all these relationships has to be with the context, of course. Context is everything. The relationship that you fostered and created, and how you want to develop that long term, because these are friendships. These are lifelong friendships. Nobody in their right mind would be an artist, and nobody in their right mind would be the dealer. It's, it's all about a passion that we share, and so you've got to work these things out carefully and sensitively, and hopefully you come through at the other end and you're both succeeding. So I think that case by case you have to just adjust to your particular situation, and, and if you think these dealers aren't going to honor it, then maybe you need to find other dealers. And then when you establish a new relationship, say to them, by the way, how do you feel if, if I'm in a situation where I can't pay my mortgage and I have somebody that wants to buy a piece, do I have permission? And what will happen, I'll tell you what I think will happen based on me. You cannot change your price to accommodate a lesser price and undermine what the gallery has done. I don't do that. I don't do that. That good. Now, you could probably take the a 20% fee off your take and give it to the gallery that's in question and say, I did the work, here's your here's your, your consultancy, and you, you're honoring their involvement even though you did the sales. You know I, I guess mean? I feel like uh, I agree with you that I, the, the, the one place I should, uh, I should pull out of. The other place um, I should be up front with and she, I think, would understand. And the other, the other place, the relationship is so soured that I should just pull out. Um, yeah, honestly, no way am I going to give that guy any money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then let's back up. No matter who you're working with, I think it's just be straight with them. You want to be treated yeah. that way, so you've got to treat them that way. I agree with what John said, but I also think that the fact that an artist has a relationship with a gallery gives that artist some additional credibility. And if the artist sells something on their own, they owe something to the gallery for the credibility, at least for the credibility generated. And if the gallery isn't giving you any credibility, get out of it. Right. You know, so I think you owe somebody something. And I don't know, maybe it's dinner. You know, maybe it's 10%. It's maybe, you know what I mean? But I think it should be acknowledged. And you should pay them, you know, <clears throat> you should pay them what you think is appropriate and then let the chips fall where they may. Um, yeah. That's that's my notion. I also think, Paul, and please tell me if you think I'm full of beans. When you get represented by a gallery, they're putting their resources into representing you, whatever that amount is. But you are also you're not just being represented by a gallery. You are representing the gallery. Your work basically is 
part of the mission statement of a particular gallery that in question. And I think that you are every time you take a breath, you are also representing that gallery. And so I think you need it's a partnership. And I think you as long as you're honest and straight and just do the right thing. You want to be remembered. It's not just your work that you'll be governed by, your reputation will be governed by. It's how you conduct yourself in the world. And I think you need to respect the people that are doing the work, and they need to respect you, and sometimes it takes a while for them to respect you. So get out of that one gallery. I agree with what John's saying. You know, and I, I, think, I think you guys realize that I am more, I, I believe much more strongly in artists than I believe in um, galleries or collectors. And I would you know, pretty much think that we want to empower artists as a mission in life. And that, you know, but it's regardless, I think, you know, they're doing something for you or something and you owe them something, okay? And I agree, and I agree completely, but Paul, I just want to say that in terms of empowering the artists, and you've been a champion of this whole thing, empowering the artists also means having them acquire the skills to develop relationships in whatever capacity with curators, collectors, gallerists. Oh, a thousand percent I agree, or maybe a little more. Um, I think we've got, Sharon, did you want to ask a question? Hold on. And then Sally, I thought Sally has her hand up. Let me go to Sally first. John, we're getting ready to wrap up. But Sally, I'm what do you want? I'm fine. I'm fine. Hey, Todd. Hi. Hey. I have you? a shout out from a uh, fellow new Trier grad. <laughs> I yeah. think we might have been in the same class. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm so proud of you. Um, thank you. I wanted to thank you for your insights, and um, I have two questions. Um, I enjoyed your website very much. You have a unique, very pure uh, vision. I think I can feel the authenticity in your work. I'm, I'm wondering if you had in grad school or beyond any, certain artists from the past or the present that influenced your work, number one. Um, it's so unique. And number two, uh, when you are in multiple galleries, uh, do you pick which of your pieces go in which gallery, say in Europe or the United States, or do they view your work online and then pick which pieces they want to represent? I don't know anything about that. When I'll you're in multiple. The, I'll answer your second question, and hello, how are you, Sally? Um, um, the, first quest, the second question is um, I can answer by saying that I'm at a point, and I, and I really am lucky, that I create a body of work for a particular requirement, whether it's a show or a gallery or uh, maybe not even for a show with a gallery, just to give work to a gallery. So sometimes if I'm working on a show, as I am right now, for a gallery in Fort Worth, Texas, um, some of the other galleries are in need of some work. And so I have to sort of divide my time between building work for a show, which will be seen as a show, and then there'll be work that will just go into an inventory of a particular gallery or be taken to an art fair or something. And so it's very interesting to kind of balance uh, certain needs. And there's a point where as these relationships evolve, you get to know what they expect of you, and they kind of under get a sense of um, what, they, what they'll be getting. And so you carefully get that together and you do that. And it's I, I'm lucky, to, uh, I'm really lucky at this point to where the time I have to just kind of free fall into new work doesn't exist. I, I'm, I've got a lot of work in process. Some of it's governed by uh, commitments to one space or another. Some of it's open for consideration and maybe not survive. Maybe it'll be destroyed in the process, but things are evolving. Now, and, um, your first question, which was, was more interesting, and I wish you could remind me what that was. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if you had certain artists that influenced oh, yeah. your vision. This is very important, and the reason I forgot my handle on this whole thing was because I, I have a number of individual artists that I regard as my my touchstones, but they're, it's really a generational thing for me. You know, I, of course, Frangelico in my distant past was is still someone I consider in my compositional uh, work, but um, I think there was a point in time where as I got through my education, I started doing my own research. Uh, there was a generation of artists which included people like Bruce Nauman, Robert Ryman, Richard Tuttle, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, I can see that. Just this, this a number of these people that were of this point in time. Robert Mangold is another one. That um, not strictly minimalist, but um, you know, I was a Clifford Still is one of my biggest influences. Um, I just think there's a lot of people that I, I regard as I mentioned in a previous question to somebody that that I, I really feel that knowing that there's other people out there doing work that I require um, helps me 
exist right now. It helps me live a life knowing that there are artists in the past and artists in the present still doing work that helps me live. You know, presently, I think the people that I respond to very, you know, Ronnie Horn, Robert Therian is very important to me. Uh, Harvey Quitman, who I can't believe has passed away, but he's a very important person to me right now. Um, I just, um, uh, a, a good friend of mine who's a contemporary of Stephen Rosen, or pardon me, of Robert Ryman is Stephen Rosenthal. So I, and over the years, I've become friends with Stephen Rosenthal and his wife, Susan Smith, who are great artists, and Marsha Haifis, and just uh, Phil Sims, and just a number of people that I think uh, give me permission to do what I do, if, if you know what I mean. So yes. I, I, and I think there are some artists that I know that do not look at other people's work because it's, for whatever reason, it's intimidating or it puts them off. I think that that's it's wrong. I think you have to be aware of what's happened. I think you have to be aware of what's happening as we speak, and I have to, you have to be sensitive to what is coming at all times. So thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, let's take one more question from Sharon and wrap this puppy up. Sharon, go ahead. Or she says that usually an artist, after 10 to 12 years with a the gallery, then it's kind of time to move on for both the artist and the gallery. Would you agree with that? <laughs> um, I'll have to speak first of my Chicago gallery, Roy Boyd. I've been with him 26, 24 years now. And for whatever reason, I, 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 there's a number of reasons, um, one of which is we have a friendship, and um, I don't think I've exhausted my time there. However, I'm aware of the fact that as I'm aging and, and the gallery's aging, that for my career's sake, maybe exploration should um, start uh, in one, one way or another. I mean, there's been a number of times, and I think any life of a relationship between a gallery and an artist goes through highs and lows, and there's been many times where through various reasons, um, it's been very difficult to stay there. But um, I've stayed there, stayed and there. and it's just one of those things that I'm very proud to say that I, I want. You know, as I mentioned this before, an artist has a reputation too, and I think that you want to come out the other end being someone that can be counted on. And I think you want to develop a relationship that, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you get out. And but I also think that there's nothing to be. You know, you think about Jasper Johns and Leo Castelli. I mean, that was a marriage. You know, and I just think that now my gallery in Germany, Renata Bender, I've been with her for maybe nine years now, and we're doing great. And the gallery in Fort Worth, this will be my, I've been with them for two years. This will be my first solo show coming up in September. Um, and I think the, the gallery in Nashville, who I'm with, Carol Stein, which is Cumberland Gallery, we've been together for over 10 years, and we've just started. We've just scratched the surface. And... Um, you know, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. Scott White out in San Diego, who I think I consider him my second gallery in terms of what he's done for me, um, he's so busy with everything globally that it's hard to really pin him down, but I, I really feel that um, I'm part of the gallery. So I think right now um, I, I can't even afford to think about anyone else at this point. I've explored New York, and I don't think I could meet the needs of another dealer right now. Something would have to give before I do anything else. And um, But I don't think it's a, it's a cut-and-dried statement to say that after 12 years you've got to leave a gallery. But I think it's up to both the gallerist and the artist to keep it fresh. And Catherine's right, absolutely, that you know, she can't be constantly thinking about, oh, I better call John Fraser to see if he's okay. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not my responsibility to call her every single day of the week. I think you need to pursue your career. You need to keep on top of it. You need to be professional. You need to handle the business appropriately. And you communicate when things need to be said. I mean, if they're trying to, to promote you, you need to actually let them know what you're doing. And that means you've got to keep them aware of everything you're doing. And it's important. And then these relationships either live or die by that. And I think it's important to take the time to cultivate these things. It's a long haul. And, of course, the ultimate goal is to be with the same dealer forever. It just is not the reality. You know? So you just got to go with the flow. Awesome, John. Thank you, everybody. You know, I mean, I don't know. I've always intended to get married to the woman I married for the rest of our lives, but, you know, I'm working <laughs> more, on the third time. You know? <laughs> hey, it's, right, it's good this time. So, I, you know, I, sometimes you have to practice. Um I think this has been really informative. I think, you know, I think John's special, you guys, and that he brings a different kind of integrity 
and holisticness, is that a word? Holistic quality to the equation. But I think facilitate, you know, and certainly he's carrying his weight in a gallery relationship. As you know, he points out that both of you are lending credibility to one another and, you know, each one is a representative of the other and that it's a team operation. And I think an attitude like that, you know, generates a more solid long-term relationship. Uh, John, you've been really generous with the information that you've shared. Your work is gorgeous. I sent out your website uh, yesterday, I think, um, so that I think a lot of people have had a chance to, you know, get a, a sense of what it is you do. Um, I don't know. It and you are special. I think that your art and your persona resonate nicely with one another, you know, and I think it touches into your core, and I think that's what you communicate. One of the things I share in this class often is the desirability of being vulnerable and putting yourself into your work so that others can get. And it doesn't, I, I've repeated this previously, that if you're vulnerable, it isn't necessarily that people look at it and say, oh, look what happened to John or look what this work is about, that they project their own vulnerability into the work and they get that message out of it. So, you know, I don't know. But I, regardless, I see a nice resonance between the work that you make and who I believe you to be. And I think we've seen really nice evidence of that tonight, and I appreciate your contribution. And I appreciate everybody here um, bearing with the uh, technological difficulties we had tonight, but I think in the end it was worth it. So, John, I'm going to unmute everybody here, and they can all um, applaud can in the general direction. Sure, go right ahead. Ah, time out. Wait a minute. i got to mute everybody first and then unmute you for that one second. Hold on, John. Yes, go ahead. I really Wait. Go ahead, start over. I really appreciate you uh, approaching me re with this evening's uh, webinar, and I want to thank everybody that attended. Um, you know, it's really important to make these kind of connections. Paul is one of those people that um, fosters goodwill and unity. Um, Chicago is an incredible city, and he's been involved in the art world for, since his inception in the gallery world. So he continues to bring a lot to the table. He should be considered a resource to stay connected with the program, and I want to thank you all for your time. All right. That said, you're more awesome than I am, and everybody is now unmuted. John, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Paul. Oh, one minute. I'm going to unmute everybody. Hold on a second. Um, I'm muting all. All right, everybody's muted. We, the, the Chicago contingent is meeting at Monique Malash Gallery, and I'm going to remember before noon tomorrow to send you information about that. And if I don't, if you don't have it by noon tomorrow, jump on my case, and I'll, you know, we'll make sure it happens. So we're, we're meeting at Monique Malash Wednesday at 2 p.m. Now that said, you are all unmuted again. And somebody was trying. Was that what you were trying to tell me? We don't know. All right, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.